focus with Ajaz Heather. Top of the menu this evening is Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi's Turkey visit. Qureshi met with Turkish Foreign Minister Mehmet Kavusoglu on 23rd April in Istanbul. During the meeting, the two foreign ministers discussed various dimensions of bilateral relations, including political and diplomatic engagement, economic cooperation, as well as the regional security situation. The two sides also discussed the ongoing preparations for the seventh session of the High-Level Strategic Cooperation Council, which will be held in Turkey post-Ramadan. Turkey has also taken a principled stand and offered Pakistan support on the issue of occupied and illegally annexed Kashmir. The two foreign ministers also exchanged views on the Afghan peace process, the Istanbul conference, and the withdrawal of foreign troops from Afghanistan. It was the third meeting between the two foreign ministers this year. The next day, on 24th, Qureshi also held a bilateral with Afghan Foreign Minister Hanif Atma. During the meeting, they discussed latest developments in the Afghan peace process. Qureshi stressed the need for concerted efforts to engage all stakeholders for a negotiated settlement to end the long conflict in Afghanistan. The three foreign ministers also had a trilateral, after which a joint statement was issued. To discuss this further, I am joined by Ambassador Tamina Janjua, former Foreign Secretary, and John Hasusu, who is a journalist at TRT RB. Let me begin with Ambassador Janjua here. Ambassador Janjua, uh, relations with Turkey, traditionally excellent relations, but over the, the years, over the past decade or so, uh, the closeness has increased and uh, now it's multifaceted. Uh, there are, the, you know, we're talking military hardware, we're talking about uh, support on issues of, of you know, uh, interest to both sides, for instance, Kashmir on our side, and, uh, you know, uh, Turkish interests as far as Kurds are concerned, and other interests. So, so there is a, there's a multifacetedness, which, which obviously now defines these relations. Give us a, a, a sort of overview of Pakistan-Turkey relations. Well, you've listed all the, the important points of Pakistan-Turkish relationship, and I think a manifestation of the Pakistan-Turkish relationship is the holding of the high-level strategic cooperation council, which is led by the the president, the Turkish president on the Turkish side and the prime minister, our prime minister on the Pakistan side, in which there are very important strategic decisions taken, especially Mind, I was a part of one of these discussions that took place when the Prime Minister visited Turkey uh, in, when I was Foreign Secretary. And I must say that there was a, a, a very close convergence of, of interest and a close convergence of, of ideas from both sides. There was a greater and great deal of emphasis by the Turkish President, which was picked up also by our, foreign, by our Prime Minister, as well as then uh, Finance Minister, Mr. Asad uh, Omar, uh, to form an economic co coordination group as well in which the relationship can be further strengthened for economic cooperation. I think that has made some headway as well. So the visit of the of the foreign minister was also firstly to deal to address some of the bilateral issues and uh, to uh, prepare for the high level strategic cooperation council meeting, which as you pointed out will be held in Turkey this year, a very important event in which some of the most important members of the of the Turkish cabinet participate and carry out discussions on how to bring closer cooperation between Pakistan and Turkey. You've rightly pointed out that Turkey has been a very, very strong supporter of Pakistan's uh, fundamental uh, issues and interests, whether it's Kashmir, whether it's participation, whether it's Qatar, whether it's um, other discussions in which Pakistan has had the support of Turkey and very much welcome so. Um, that's the and also also on the cultural level, there is a lot of effort that's going on to bring the two countries closer at the in the cultural context as well. Um, you talked about defense. Defense cooperation is an important part of our relationship. But now there is an important new element to the relationship, which is Turkey taking a lead role. Uh, President Erdogan obviously taking a lead role on trying to find 
a solution through the peace process on Afghanistan. Um, the peace process was the meeting for the for the peace process was to take place in Istanbul on the 24th of April, but and, and because of the Taliban reluctance to attend at this point, it was a, the Turkish side agreed that it was best to postpone it and the dates for that meeting are now going to be decided, but the indication is that it will be after Eid, Eid al-Fitr. So, and uh, the meeting therefore also provided an opportunity, foreign minister's meeting also provided an opportunity to discuss in detail Turkish leadership in the context of the Afghan peace process. Also, during the foreign minister's visit, there was a trilateral meeting between the Afghan foreign minister uh, the Turkish foreign minister and our foreign minister, on which after which a joint statement was issued, in which there was complete agreement on having um, an inclusive uh, peace process that would take into account the concerns of all Afghans, and that there should be the focus should remain on uh, the peace process, and that there was no military solution to the problems in in Afghanistan, and peace uh, the peace process was the best best way out. And um, so that was an opportunity for the three leaders to, uh, for the three foreign ministers to, sh uh, to share notes and to come to uh, common understandings, to continue to hold the common understandings. Turkish participation in the current process with, uh, U with the UN and with Qatar, we believe, is extremely important. Turkey has some significant uh, positions uh, of interest within Afghanistan. Turkey is a, is a member of NATO. Turkey is also responsible for the security of Kabul in the, in, um, under the NATO uh, process as well. And Turkey has some very important contacts in the north of, of uh, Afghanistan as well. So these are important points that we must remember in, the, in putting Turkey in the lead position with regard to facilitating a peace process. Um, may I also underscore that questions are often raised why Qatar is, the talks have moved from Qatar. It's not true. The Qatar, Qatar negotiating process between the inter-Afghan process will continue as it is, and therefore Qatar and Turkey and the UN continue to remain um, the, the uh, proponents of the, of the peace process, the meeting to be held in Istanbul. So here is an important area of convergence between Pakistan and, and Turkey, and an area which, was, uh, which we must appreciate Turkey's leadership role in because peace in the region is critical for peace, uh, for global peace as well. Right. Uh, quickly, before I, I go to John Hassasu, uh, a recent issue that has, of course, emerged and uh, uncries uh, is livid, uh, and that has to do with uh, U.S. President Biden's statement on Armenia, uh, what he called the Armenian genocide, uh, a term that obviously... Uh, Turkey absolutely rejects. Now, one of the things that is being talked about is that perhaps Turkey's reaction to this, among other things, might also be uh, the decision to not host uh, the, the Istanbul conference uh, in relation to, you know, uh, this, this whole sort of, you know, uh, seeking uh, a just settlement in Afghanistan and getting everyone to agree to. to. Now, if that happens, and now it's a big if, uh, I'm not saying that that's going to happen, but some experts are talking about this. Uh, would that have, uh, you know, any impact on the situation in Afghanistan? I think we should not be speculating too much about the linkage between the, the, the U.S. decision on Armenia and uh, um, uh, Armenia and calling uh, the, the entire pro the incident a uh, uh, genocide uh, and the Afghan peace process to which the, the uh, Turkish government has shown full and complete commitment, especially the president of Turkey. This is, uh, yes, the meeting that was being called in Istanbul was uh, at perhaps the at the suggestion of the U.S. But I think the, the uh, Turkish, well, it's a terrible uh, time for that announcement to come. 
I think the Turkish leadership would be uh, much, is very uh, supportive of uh, the peace initiative within the region. And therefore, we should not speculate too soon of what the Turkish decision in this regard would be. What we must underscore is that, let's not forget that, that Turkey has been one of the most faithful proponent of peace within Afghanistan has worked very hard in this regard and has worked with Pakistan as well. And therefore, it is important that we do not make any speculations at, that, at this stage. And let's wait and see what the reaction of the Turkish government would be the, uh, to the proposal for the Istanbul uh, meeting. We, sh of course, the, the reaction of the Turkish government, of the Turkish people has been very, uh, as uh, expected. It is uh, perhaps not the moment to make this, this decision, which undermines the, the efforts that Turkey is making um, in, uh, in, in having regional, in working with regional actors to have peace within the region and therefore um, let's wait and see what will happen but in i would imagine that uh, this would this would obviously uh, have some impact but not necessarily an impact on trying to hold the istanbul meeting uh, but let's wait and see Right. Uh, of course, uh, one shouldn't speculate. I was just referring to, uh, you know, some of the analysts uh, looking at the various possibilities, and this one also came up. But thank you so much. That was Ambassador Tamina Janjua speaking with us. Let me go to John Hassasuya. John, uh, one, of course, uh, this very issue of uh, what President Biden said and how Turkey is going to react. And secondly, uh, give our viewers a sense of how Turkey looks at relations with Pakistan and what is the significance of Turkish-Pakistan relations? Sure. Of course, that was Biden's decision. It's not, we can't really name it as the U.S. administration's uh, view on the issue. Uh, that was uh, one of Biden's political maneuvers, actually. It has no legal uh, basis and it's not going to affect uh, Turkey uh, in, in the international arena since it's only uh, uh, mentioning uh, 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 a quotation in a speech that Biden uh, promised to his Armenian electors, voters uh, in the U.S. before the elections, but still it's a sensitive and important issue for Turkey. Of course, Turkey is not going to put uh, this equal with uh, peace talks in Afghanistan, a stable uh, Afghanistan and a peace in the region is no match to what we are talking about uh, for Turkey. Uh, Turkey is not going to jeopardize that important issue with this uh, thing. Uh, but of course, uh, Turkish uh, leadership has been asking for a fair and a scientific um, uh, study about the issue. And they declare that they are ready to accept uh, the results of an international and scientific uh, gathering, uh, discussing what happened, what really happened in 1915 uh, in this specific uh, region. Uh, but uh, so of course, all the politicians now in Turkey, even the opposition, is against what uh, Joe Biden, Biden has choose uh, because they are all thinking that this kind of uh, political show-ups is going to harm the relationships between Turkey and the U.S., uh, both political and commercial relationships. Absolutely, yeah. it's, a, it's a very sensitive issue for Turkey. And, and this comes at a time when uh, U.S.-Turkey relations are not uh, particularly good. Uh, this reference, since we're also talking about turkish pakistan relations that I mentioned in my opening also, that uh, there is a lot of defense cooperation also. Turkey, in fact, won uh, a major contract with Pakistan, about $1.5 billion of credit line for attack helicopters, and Turkey has not been able to deliver those, uh, not because Turkey doesn't want to, but because the helicopter engine uh, is partly manufactured by Honeywell, which is a U.S. firm, and since Turkey is under sanctions, so this entire deal is now stuck because of Turkey-U.S. relations. So give us a sense of that also, and the overall 
you know, significance of Turkey-Pakistan cooperation and relations with respect to core interests on both sides. Well, actually, Turkey itself is dealing with the same kind of problems as well. As you know, the F-35 project, Turkey has been suspended in this project because of its decision to buy the Russian S-400 uh, missile defense system. So Turkey, uh, whenever Turkey is pushed to the corner with these kind of sanctions, with these kind of bans, Turkey comes out with its own products, within, with, uh, with, uh, with its own solutions to the problem. So this kind of um, uh, policies to eliminate, to punish, uh, if you like, Turkey and its allies is uh, not uh, really helping out. Uh, actually, uh, it is helping Turkey to develop its uh, defense uh, system uh, and to rely on itself and to produce its own national products and um, uh, the, the uh, unmanned uh, aerial vehicles uh, which uh, uh, reached a big success in the war in Karabakh and in Syria is one of these examples. And I'm sure that Turkey with collaboration with uh, other countries, friend countries like Pakistan, that could, they, they could develop uh, more projects and they could produce their own helicopters that are flying with their own engines. There is no doubt of that. And Pakistan being one of the most important countries for Turkey and being one of the countries it's in, in its uh, natural, historic, political, uh, and cultural uh, habitat, if you like, uh, with, uh, uh, with the uh, problems in Afghanistan, uh, they are collaborating now to solve the problem in Afghanistan, which will be good for the people of Afghanistan and for Pakistan as well, which has been affected by the problem uh, since the Russian invasion all the way up to uh, these days. Uh, so what Turkey tries to do is uh, to make Pakistan and Afghanistan to solve a major problem uh, which uh, has become a major issue for the people who lives in these areas and gives them the chance to recover from the damage that they had throughout the years and to uh, for the possibility and to, to spend effort, their best efforts to give them the possibility to start again and to live a normal life at least. So in this sense, I think Turkey uh, is the country uh, which is trusted by Pakistan, by Af uh, Afghanistan, and has good relations with the other neighboring country, is going to play uh, a very important role uh, in terms of to, to uh, address some of the trust issues, especially between Taliban and the U.S. administration or uh, the Afghani uh, parties and the Western parties. So Turkey is a uh, reliable uh, mediator in this term and its efforts uh, of uh, establishing peace in the region will really help first Afghanistan and that will be uh, a good win for Pakistan as well since Pakistan he, it has it has uh, major two major security issues one is when uh, with with India and the other being with uh, Afghanistan and its borders with the country uh, so solving the problem on the Afghani border will give uh, a, a lot of time and uh, will save a lot of stuff for Pakistan and Islamabad's government to address its other issues. Absolutely. Uh, Pakistan security and peace is a must for Pakistan security and peace. Thank you so much. That was John Hassasu speaking with us. Joining me now is Ravel Mohayuddin, who works at TRT World and writes about media effects in society and public diplomacy. Ravel, thank you for being on the program. Now, here's the thing. You're a Pakistani. You work in Turkey. And so you look at, you have the district advantage of looking at these bilateral relations from both perspectives. So give us a sense of how you look at the significance of these relations, uh, purely what inheres in them, and also uh, with respect to the ongoing efforts to find a solution 
a peaceful solution for Afghanistan. I think both Pakistan and Turkey are uh, very naturally suited to find a solution together for Afghanistan. Uh, Turkey being a NATO partner, uh, Turkey being an Islamic country, Pakistan being a Muslim country, Pakistan being very, very impacted by uh, the violence in Afghanistan, Turkey being a very big donor in the country, Turkey actually being, uh, Turkish forces have actually been uh, in Afghanistan for a very long time. They together have a lot more to say about what's going on in the country, in Afghanistan, and they also are impacted by it. Now, what they do uh, to kind of, they become natural partners in this uh, situation where they kind of make sure Afghanistan gets back on track. Now, it is the need of the hour. Uh, the U.S. has uh, basically conceded to the Taliban demand of actually leaving, withdrawing from uh, the country. Now, they, there's a massive uh, risk here of uh, the, a civil war actually happening in Afghanistan, which actually um, or really, really leads to Pakistan being in a very, very difficult position. Pakistan, as we know, has suffered for decades due to instability in Afghanistan. Now, what Pakistan does right now uh, in response to the U.S. leaving is going to be critical for the coming decade, uh, if not longer. Now, previously, Qatar was hosting these uh, talks uh, between uh, the Taliban and the Afghan government. Now, Turkey has been entrusted with this role by the U.S. The U.S. is uh, interested in kind of de uh, developing the. It's I don't know whether this where this is going, but it certainly looks like that uh, the U.S. is entrusting Turkey with this really big responsibility of actually developing a platform where all the regional countries come together to create a solution for Afghanistan. Whether that actually goes forward in any in any uh, significant way is actually dependent on the, on Afghanistan's neighbors. Pre predominantly Pakistan, China, and Iran regionally come up with a response to, the, to whatever's going on, to actually responsibly ending Afghanistan's war, uh, civil war, uh, Afghanistan's war. So now what, how Pakistan and Turkey bring all of these uh, partners together on the platform is actually it's, it's becoming, Pakistan already had a very transactional relationship with the U.S., in my opinion. Now Turkey is also developing a transactional relationship with the U.S. Um, instead of previously when they were uh, it, from a bilateral to a transactional relationship. Now what we, how we bring these, all these parties together is going to be a testament to Pakistan and Turkey's relationship with each other. Pakistan and Turkey has enjoyed a lot of respect, a lot of trust. And if they can translate that to a, um, a sustainable solution for Afghanistan by bringing Afghanistan, all the regional partners, as well as the U.S. onto the table, I think there is going to be a, um, a massive change in the way this uh, conflict is resolved moving forward. Right. I mean, I agree with you. That's the need of the hour. But here's the thing. There's many a slip betwixt the cup and the lip. And just to uh, recall, uh, the trilateral in Istanbul, uh, which which had the Afghan foreign minister, the Pakistani foreign minister, and the Turkish foreign minister, the joint statement, among other things, recalled that the Istanbul conference had been postponed after extensive discussions with all relevant parties with a view to holding the conference when conditions for making meaningful progress would be more favorable, therefore called on all parties, in particular the Taliban, to reaffirm their commitment for achieving an inclusive negotiated settlement leading to lasting peace in Afghanistan desired by the Afghan people, the region, and the international community. And simultaneously, the Joint Statement also deplored the continuing high level of violence in Afghanistan, especially regretting the high number of civilian casualties and particularly condemned attacks targeting civil service employees, civil society activists, human rights defenders, journalists, and media workers. So this is as far as the, some of the uh, highlights of the Joint Statement are concerned. But finally, uh, before I wrap up, 
Ravel, the, uh, the, the point is that, of course, Pakistan has constantly been saying that Pakistan's own security, Pakistan's own peace is heavily dependent on peace in Afghanistan. Taliban have dug in, frankly, uh, because there are there is there is uh, uh, you know some of the analysts are saying that because they see that the Americans are leaving, uh, they are going to just wait it out. Now that's not the kind of scenario that Pakistan uh, wants or would want. Uh, do you think there is a there is a, a realization uh, in Turkey also that that's a scenario that? Uh, is not uh, desirable, uh, that that is something for which perhaps Turkey, Pakistan, Iran, and also China and Russia can actually pressure the Taliban into coming to the table and actually trying to work out, instead of delaying things, actually trying to work out a deal with the Kabul government. Taliban is the analysts are absolutely correct. They are actually we uh, betting on the U.S. leaving as quickly as they say they do, and they're trying to wait it out. However, uh, there is a realization around the world uh, that if they do not uh, have a political solution to this the, to the one problem, uh, one war uh, conflict, there is going to be a problem uh, and with regional regional fallout. So it's not just uh, you know uh, just Pakistan going to be impacted. There's Central Asia, which is going to be impacted. China will be impacted. Uh, Iran and Turkey. So uh, uh, right now, it's there is definite uh, urgency uh, on the cards when it comes to managing this. Uh, and I don't know. I, uh, personally speaking, I am quite. Uh, uh, surprised at the Taliban not take, pouncing on the opportunity that they actually had said that they, you know, the U.S. leaves, then we're going to start the conversation if the U.S. is going to leave. Now, the U.S. has conceded to their demand. The U.S. has given a date. U.S. is going to go leave. So now, at this point, they have massive... Uh, uh, it's responsibility of the Taliban to actually commit to what they had promised earlier. However, uh, they are going to try and take advantage of the situation uh, to their ben benefit, to, max to extract the most amount of power that they can. Uh, what that means for regional countries, I mean, Pakistan has always, always maintained a, um, a, uh, a, a, a dialogue with the Taliban. And I think previously, in, in recent years, Turkey has also warmed up to the concept as well. So, at this point, from the perspective of the Taliban, yeah, so lots of they are, lots of yeah. region, lots of regional countries are dialoguing with the Taliban. They've been in contact, including China and Iran. Uh, but uh, the Taliban, at no point, uh, ever said that they. As a matter of fact, initially they were saying they don't even want to talk to the Kabul government. But clearly, since there is no real framework agreed upon as yet, so technically they can always say that unless there is a framework, uh, there is no point in carrying on with the, uh, you know talking to the Kabul government. But that is where regional countries have to come in. Uh, unfortunately, I've run out of time for this segment, but thank you so much. That was Ravel Mayuddin speaking with us. We shall take a short break and return to discuss the deteriorating COVID-19 situation in India. Stay with us. Welcome back to In Focus. Reports and video footages coming out of India are scary. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who was until recently campaigning in West Bengal for state elections, has now said the virus surge has shaken India. We were confident our spirits were up after successfully tackling the first wave, but this storm has shaken the nation, he was reported as saying in a radio address. His government is being criticized for mishandling the situation and allowing religious and political gatherings that experts say have contributed to the current surge. Hospitals and doctors have put out urgent notices saying they're unable to cope with the rush of patients. Epidemiologists and virologists say more infectious variants of the virus, including an Indian one known as B1617, have fueled the ferocious surge. 
Doctors at New Delhi's All India Institute of Medical Sciences have found that one patient is now infecting up to nine in 10 contacts compared to about four last year. To discuss this grim situation further, I'm joined by Dr. Anand Bhan, a medical doctor who also researches in the fields of global health, health policy and bioethics, and Vidya Krishnan. Ms. Krishnan is a freelance reporter and was formerly health editor at the Hindi newspaper. Her first book, Phantom Plague, the untold story of how tuberculosis shaped our history, will be published this year. Thank you to both panelists. Let me begin with Dr. Bhan here. Dr. Bhan, uh, you've been on the program before. We've been discussing the situation. And last time when we spoke, uh, you know, there was a sense that things are looking up. Uh, the situation is under control. Uh, but now uh, it, it seems that uh, things have really gotten out of hand. As a matter of fact, uh, daily coronavirus cases, uh, India is setting a global record for a fifth straight day and deaths have also jumped by an all-time high. So what, what went wrong? You're absolutely right. The last time we spoke, you know, indeed, uh, things were looking up. We'd gone through almost, uh, I think, almost three months of cases uh, going down. And uh, that was, uh, you know, a period when I think, unfortunately, a lot of uh, easing up happened way too soon. Uh, you know, obviously we can blame variants, we can blame mutations, but in many ways this has also been a policy failure. We forgot the basics. Uh, public health precautions were not heeded. A uh, lot of large congregations were allowed and uh, the end result is uh, the kind of uh, num absolutely horrifying numbers that we're seeing as you were highlighting um, around 3,50,000 cases uh, reported just yesterday and almost 2,800 deaths. And remember, these are just official data. The actual numbers might be higher. Um, so, you know, this just tells us that uh, India right now uh, is facing uh, an emergency situation. Uh, this, again, is only talking about COVID-19. There is also non-COVID-19 care, which is negatively impacted every time the focus shifts to COVID care. And uh, this should worry us all because the kind of stress it is putting on the health system is enormous. And this is potentially uh, going to have not just short-term but long-term impact um, on the ability uh, to cope. Um, and obviously, it's causing a lot of grief, which is really unfortunate. Right. Uh, let me pull in Ms. Krishnan here. Ms. Krishnan, uh, clearly, as I said, you, you, you know, you've written a book also. Uh, this is an area that you're well-versed with. How does this work? I mean, uh, I'm asking this because there are a number of people who also say, in response to criticism of uh, Mr. Modi's government, that people also need to look at the fact that India is such a big country, 1.4 billion population, uh, nearly 400 million people are illiterate or semi-literate. It's extremely difficult for any government to crack down in a way that, for instance, China did, and so on and so forth. So give me your sense of how much blame you would apportion uh, the current government in India and how much of it can be apportioned to the people themselves. Mr. Heather, I don't know how else to say it. All of the blame lies on this government. It is not okay to say that India is a big country because this government got elected knowing that India is a big country. It's not like they were elected in New Zealand and then suddenly asked to govern India. Secondly, it is heartbreaking to blame Indian citizens at this point for being illiterate because India has a very long and very proud history of lining up for vaccinations. India has never had anti-vaccine movements. Uh, uh, for as long as I remember, every Sunday we've had uh, uh, polio Sundays where people have volunteered. Um, it's... It's very self-serving of the government to blame that people are poor and illiterate and so they don't know vaccines help. That is not true. Poor parents also love their children and they have always come forward with vaccinations. Here, the issue is that the government lied to the people and said there is no second wave. And then in their triumphalism, went and the Kumbh Mela is still on. There is between 30 to 50 million people still in Uttar Pradesh. Um, the election was an eight-phase, brutal, long election. So before we start blaming India's poor people, 
I would hold the government to account. So, so you are saying that the government uh, declared victory very early and thought that this is now under control. I, I just in my opening, uh, you know, quoted uh, 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 Mr. Modi saying that our spirits were up after successfully tackling the first wave. So you're saying that that was, uh, that was self-complacency uh, and you're also saying, or at least implying, that uh, the public uh, healthcare system uh, remains weak and you're not spending too much money on that. And the most interesting thing, which I frankly did not know, uh, that you don't have anti-vaxxers in India, which is great because, I mean, you have those even in developed countries like the United States. But let me take your observations back to Dr. Anand Bhan. Uh, Dr. Bhan, what are you going to say about what Vidya Krishnan is saying? So, uh, I mean, there's a uh, little uh, debate here about the fact that there's been a big policy failure. I mean, I, I don't think that anyone can uh, disagree with. And I think all of us have been trying to, trying to reinforce that. Uh, a lot of this could have been forecast. Uh, there were experiences from multiple other countries which showed that a resurgence was always a possibility. And in many cases, it came back with a vengeance. Um, you know, there's one, if there's one thing we've learned about the virus is that you don't know enough about the virus. Uh, you can only follow the fundamentals of public health. So given that situation and also because, you know, our health system had uh, fairly been impacted negatively last year uh, when the cases increased in the summer, that we should have used the time to rebuild the health system, make it more resilient. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, again, a lot of steps were taken which allowed for uh, increased social interactions. Uh, governments felt that it was okay to allow for congregations of the kind that they are described. Um, and uh, there was just uh, not enough reinforcement of public health messaging, whether about vaccination, whether about uh, usage of masks, etc. In fact, there was poor role modeling by uh, many leaders, and that pro probably contributed to just uh, this explosion of cases that we are seeing now. And uh, unfortunately, a uh, health system, which could have invested uh, a lot of resources into building the capacity to be able to deal with any kind of a surge situation, was found wanting and is still found, uh, you know, in a situation where uh, we, you know, people are scrambling for basics like oxygen. Uh, which, uh, you know, it's not right. rocket science, it's not a new vaccine, it's a new drug, it's just the basics of what you provide in a hospital setting. Let's hope that the situation can be addressed. Thank you so much. That was Dr. Anand Bhan speaking with us. Let me go back to Vidya Krishnan here. So Vidya Krishnan, here's the thing. So even if the virus, and of course, viruses mutate, even if it's not more virulent, if it's become more infectious, that means one vector is is infecting uh, lots of more people. And uh, even when uh, not many people get to the hospitals, if we go by sheer numbers in terms of, you know, the exponential uh, rise, there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, pressure on the healthcare system. And as Dr. Bhan said, this is not the only thing. I mean, the hospitals are also dealing with various other uh, diseases and, and, you know, conditions. So, Suddenly you find that the healthcare system is, is collapsing. I mean, some of the footages are, I mean, I don't know how far they are accurate because I'm not in India, but with people actually lying in corridors uh, in the parking lots of hospitals, uh, there have been uh, videos of people stealing oxygen cylinders. It's almost like uh, all hell has broken loose. What's happening in India right now is too late to contain. I was looking at fresh projections and some epidemiologists are saying we can expect up to a million deaths till by August. And the carnage in India is now unavoidable, even with universal vaccination and even with universal maxing, uh, uh, masking. We cannot stop what's already underway. The only lesson in what's happening in India is for Pakistan, for uh, I'm looking at uh, numbers in Nepal, they are rising up, is to get vaccines to the people as quickly as they can because the hospitals are not better in a, all countries in Southeast Asia are low and middle income developing nations. And if we don't urgently get vaccines safe in Pakistan to Pakistani citizens, uh, this mutated virus in the second surge is dangerous and India is just ahead in the coach of 
the other countries which have weaker health systems that are going to follow so i really hope the lesson from india suffering is not lost absolutely i i couldn't agree more with you stay with me i'm also joined by dr daria onatma who's a professor of immunology at the jackson laboratory for genomic medicine uh professor onatma thank you for being on the program as always we've been discussing this over the last uh, more than a year now uh, off and on the ravages of this virus today we are discussing the situation in india so give me your sense of what went wrong in india because uh you know until about august september last year uh, india thought that uh, the worst was over i think it's a combination of factors and uh, misassumptions i would say because um in fact india was a puzzle uh it has uh, you know 1.4 billion population uh but really uh, until recently uh covid infection was uh, i mean corona infection was was quite mild so people assume that uh, you know somehow uh, uh indian population had been infected and they've already become Im- immune uh and so uh this this was passed and uh, they relaxed uh, re- uh, all the restrictions uh, and and so on and so forth unfortunately uh, what happened was the virus was mutating at the same time and people who have been previously infected who had mild infection or asymptomatic start to get reinfected uh and uh, you know what happens also is that uh, when you have all these restrictions lifted uh in big events like um you know uh, uh shows or or gatherings and and things of that nature you can have super spreading events uh, what that means that one one person can spread to hundreds of people uh, in one environment and i think that just lit the fire uh, and uh, and and of course the the emergence of these mutants uh virus is not the same virus now it just simply uh infects more people it's much more infectious it can evade anybody's uh previous previous immunity uh, so i think it's a combination of these factors led to this disaster unfortunately uh, uh professor rohit mas uh, my other expert uh, vidya krishnan is saying that just for you joined us uh that what has happened in india is now india will have to pay the price for it uh and you know she gave a scary figure of uh, up to 1 million deaths and she also said and i completely agree that uh other countries in the region including pakistan bangladesh nepal uh have to be very careful because uh this could happen here also uh so how do you look at the i mean given that it's the fifth uh consecutive day uh record uh cases uh very high uh you know numbers dying uh what possibly can be done to try and uh, ameliorate the situation the situation is so dire that the, the, I, i see no other uh, choice but complete lockdown of of the country i mean uh, the whole healthcare system uh, in some cities have collapsed there's r- literally no oxygen left uh, i think at this point uh, uh, you can't just wait for the vaccines uh, india is producing its own vaccines uh, up to about i think 70 80 million doses uh but to vaccinate such a vast population you need months and months and you really need the second dose and so on so uh in the short term you really have to have very very strict uh, um uh, measures uh, uh in particular because this virus is much more infectious now uh, even the previous uh, you know precautions or restrictions are not going to be sufficient so i i uh, honestly i don't see any any other choice but uh, uh very very draconian uh, restrictions okay uh, bangalore and some other cities are already uh, i think they have decided to do this but uh, professor unath mara for i go back to uh, vidya krishnan uh, this indian variant uh, which technically is b1617 uh, what exactly is it i mean can you translate this in english i mean it's called uh, so called double double mutant uh, but that's not uh, scientifically a correct term actually but just just so that people understand it the virus has many mutations and it constantly evolves and gathers these mutations but most of these mutations don't really affect its function but there are two particular mutations that are very dangerous so one type that makes the virus more infectious in other words fewer viral particles will allow itself to be uh, to get into your body uh, because it just binds to the lock on the surface of cells better it's it's key gets better and better uh, 
so that uh, there is one such mutation uh, that occurred in, in India. Of course, there was one in England, as you know, it really spread throughout the world. So these viruses are competing with each other. The ones that are more infections, the, the better mutations have an advantage, but they start to spread. The second type of mutation, which uh, also is present in the Indian variant, is the type that can escape the antibodies, the immune system. So people who had, for example, mild COVID before, uh, they generate these antibodies, the smart missiles that can stop the virus. Unfortunately, this new variant finds a way to hide from those uh, missiles uh, and, and can, can now still enter into the body. So it's a double effect uh, of uh, both infecting those who have, even partially uh, those who have been vaccinated. And so that makes it uh, very, very dangerous. Would, would this also mean uh, uh, it could, you know, the antibodies created by vaccination, uh, it could also evade those antibodies? Vaccine uh, actually is much more, much more effective than uh, the infection itself. The infection itself also creates immunity. Uh, but unfortunately, if you have a mild infection or a symptomatic infection, your immune response is not, that doesn't really care too much. It says, well, this is not really so dangerous, so I'm not going to generate such a high amount of antibodies and produce this energy. But the vaccines are pushing the immune system to generate lots of antibodies and what we call T cells that are sort of like special forces of the immune system. And so, uh, yes, their effectiveness is reduced somewhat for, the, uh, for these mutations, uh, but they still uh, prevent, for example, severe disease or death. So vaccines are regardless uh, very effective against these mutants, uh, even though they lose a little bit of a capacity. Absolutely. That was Professor Daria Onatma speaking with us. Before I wrap up, let me quickly go back to Ms. Krishnan here. Ms. Krishnan, so uh, Professor Onatma is saying that lockdown, uh, a draconian lockdown, is in fact the only, it's a bad choice, but it's also the only choice right now because there's no way that India can vaccinate. The majority of the population is going to take months and months. Is that something that you'd agree with? See, the lockdown, I, it doesn't matter whether I agree with it or not. Uh, the political reality is that the Narendra Modi government implemented a brutal lockdown when it was not needed, when India had four or 500 cases and uh, added a humanitarian crisis to the medical emergency last year. And now when we do have a medical crisis, Lockdown is no more left as an option because uh, the Modi government used it uh, already and that card cannot be played again because the economy is devastated. People are traumatized by what happened. Uh, the uh, Delhi uh, 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 railway stations and bus stations are already flooded with people trying to get back home, scarred by what, was, uh, what happened last year. So, and now the central government has passed the uh, blame on to the state government saying, if you want to lock down, that is your choice. The problem here is there is complete lack of leadership at central level in India right now. More than the medical crisis, more than the mutation, more than the shortage of vaccination, the political decisions are the ones that are costing most lives in India right now. And I personally do not see this government imposing a lockdown because they played that political card. And it's so difficult to predict what's happening. Every day is a new heartbreak. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. I, 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 I hear you loud and clear, uh, Ms. Krishnan, uh, and I'm really, really sorry. Uh, what's happening there and uh, you know I, I think we will unfortunately probably have to revisit the situation again in one of the programs uh, but thank you so much for speaking with us this is all from in focus this evening we shall see you tomorrow at the same time keep following our latest updates on social media at news. and you just heard the discussion given the COVID-19 wave and it's the third wave in Pakistan um, and across the world Stay safe and follow the non-vaccine safety protocols. Good night and goodbye.